What's up, everybody? This is your boy Tech G back with another video to help you successfully pass the CompTIA Security Plus SY0 601 certification. So let's get into it. In this video, you're going to learn about social engineering techniques such as pre pending, identity fraud, invoice scams, credential harvesting, reconnaissance, hoax, impersonation, watering hole attacks, typo squatting, pretexting influence campaigns and principles pertaining to reasons for effectiveness. Let's talk about prepending. So prepend, this is a word that means to attach content as a prefix. It is often used in different kinds of programming and in automated processes. Some prepending is done manually as a user. So for example, a prepend command could be used in scripting language that a programmer would enter into a certain function or code module. It would add certain characters or text to the beginning of some variable or object. Other kinds of prepending is automated like I stated earlier you can configure email servers or cloud email services to prepend a message in the email subject line to identify emails that are coming from outside of the organization next we have identity fraud so identity theft this occurs when an assailant impersonates you for their own gain using stolen information that is often used to identify you such as your social security number address etc and some examples of some of the nefarious actions that may be carried by a criminal using your identity include the following. They can go out there and do things like open up a bank account or credit card accounts that are tied directly to you. They can file a bogus tax return and collect your refund. They can make online purchases, sometimes with the intentions of selling the goods on the black market, or they can claim your identity to shift medical expense liability. This is known as medical identity theft. Next, we have invoice scams. So invoice scams are when scammers send unsolicited emails and other messages to victims that include an invoice as a malicious attachment for something that they have not purchased. So for instance, a scammer might send you a targeted email message, including an invoice for something that you most likely have purchased in the past. The scammer may look for information about you and then send a targeted email, such as an invoice. And typically these scams work in three steps. You got step one, the fishers attempt to find contracts and names of suppliers providing goods to a particular company. Company. They impersonate a legit supplier and send bills to the subordinate personnel. And they try to solidify their efforts by sending fake letters that claim to come from the actual supplier's designated bank. And fake invoice scams, they tend to take advantage of the fact that the average email user or someone handling administrative tasks for business or personal affairs may not know whether any product or service has actually been purchased. Next, we have credential harvesting. So credential harvesting or password harvesting harvesting. This is the process of gathering valid usernames, passwords, private emails, and email addresses through infrastructure breaches. The possible motivations for such a breach are many. They could be things like the hacker could sell delicate personal and financial data on the dark web. They can gain access to a company network for purposes of corporate espionage and steal IPs or other assets, or they can use that data to embezzle money. A commonly cited source of credential harvesting is the use of phishing emails. These emails contain an attachment encoded with a hyperlink that when clicked uploads data stealing programs onto your console. While phishing emails are the most common avenue, credential harvesting can also be performed by malware viruses, clone website links, the use of unsecured third-party vendors, and ransomware. In many cases, the breach user often has no knowledge that the malicious attack has even occurred. Next, we have reconnaissance. So in the context of cybersecurity, Reconnaissance, this is the practice of covertly discovering and collecting information about a system. This method is often used in ethical hacking or penetration testing. And reconnaissance generally follows seven steps. You got step one, collect initial data. Two, you want to determine the network range. You want to identify active machines. You want to find access points and open ports. You want to fingerprint the operating system. You want to discover services on ports. And then you want to map the network. And using these steps, an attacker will aim to gain the following information about a network, such as file permissions, running network services, operating system platforms, trust relationships, and user account information. And one of the most common techniques involved with reconnaissance is port scanning, which sends data to various TCP and UDP ports on a device and evaluates the response. 
Next, we have a hoax. So a hoax, this is the attempt at deceiving people into believing something that is false. The difference between a hoax and phishing can be quite gray. However, a hoax can come in person or through other means of communication, whereas phishing is generally regulated to e-communication and phones. Although phishing can occur at any time and with the specific goal of obtaining private information, a hoax can be often perpetuated on holidays or other special days and could be carried out simply for fun. Regardless, a hoax can use up valuable organization resources such as email replies, internet bandwidth usage, time spent, etc. Next, we have impersonation, and this is a form of fraud in which attackers pose as a known or trusted person to dupe an employee into transferring money to a fraudulent account, sharing sensitive information such as intellectual property, financial data or payroll information, or revealing login credentials that attackers can use to to hack into a company's computer network. CEO fraud, business email compromise, and whaling, these are specific forms of impersonation attacks where malicious individuals pose as high-level executives within the company. Impersonation attacks are typically malware-less attacks conducted through email, using social engineering to gain the trust of a targeted employee. Attackers may research a victim online, gathering information from social media accounts and other online sources, which when used in the text of an email, can lend authenticity to the message. Next is a watering hole attack, and this is a computer attack strategy in which an attacker guesses or observes which websites an organization often uses and affects one or more of them with malware. Eventually, some members of the targeted group will become infected. Hacks looking for specific information may only attack users coming from a specific IP address. This also makes the hacks harder to detect and research. Then we have typo squatting also known as URL hijacking or fake URLs. And this is a form of cyber squatting and possibly brand jacking, which relies on mistakes such as typos made by internet users when inputting a website address into a web browser. Should a user accidentally enter an incorrect website address, they may be led to any URL, including an alternative website owned by a cyber squatter. And the typo squatter's URL will usually be one of five kinds, all similar to the victim's site address. It may be they have a common misspelling or foreign language spelling of the intended site. There may be misspelling based on a typographical error. There may be a plural of a singular domain name. You may have a different top level domain. So you might have .com instead of .org. Or there could be an abuse of the country code top level domain where you might see .cm or .co or .om instead of .com. Now, once a user is in a typo squatter site, the user may also be tricked into thinking that they are in fact at the real site through the use of copied or similar logos, website layouts, or content. Spam emails sometimes make use of typo squatting URLs to trick users into visiting malicious sites that look like a given bank's website. So as you can see in this picture here, you got paypal.com, a typo squatter site, maybe one of the other ones down at the bottom down there. Next is pretext. Texting, and this is a type of social engineering attack that involves a situation or pretext created by an attacker in order to lure a victim into a vulnerable situation and to trick them into giving private information, specifically information that the victim would typically not give outside the context of the pretext. In its history, pretexting has been described as the first stage of social engineering and has been used by the FBI to aid in investigations. A reason for pretexting's prevalence among social engineering attacks is its reliance on manipulating people in order to gain access to the information the attacker wants versus having to hack into a technological system. When looking for victims, attackers can watch out for a variety of characteristics such as the ability to trust, low perception of threat, response to authority, and susceptibility to react with fear or excitement in different situations. Then we have influence campaigns, and we have two major ones here. The first one is called hybrid warfare, and this is a subject originally employed by the armed forces. However, attackers use hybrid warfare techniques in cyber and influential campaigns to manipulate people to believe something that may not be true by using different types of propaganda that are often shared on social media sites. And then you have social media. Threat actors, they will use automated bots in social media sites like Twitter and Facebook to influence the sentiment of a given user. These 
bots are used to try to manipulate public sentiment on contentious issues ranging from political events, gun control, abortion, etc. Then we have principles pertaining to reasons for effectiveness. So the following are several motivation techniques that are used by social engineers. The first one is authority. So a social engineer shows confidence and perhaps authority, whether legal, organizational, or social authority. You have intimidation. Attackers can use intimidation to manipulate their victims to perform some action or to reveal sensitive information. Next, you have a consensus or social Social proof, and this is a psychological phenomenon in which an individual is not able to determine the appropriate mode of behavior. So, for example, you might see others acting or doing something in a certain way and might assume that it is appropriate. Social engineers might use this tactic when the individual enters an unfamiliar situation that he or she doesn't know how to deal with, and social engineers might manipulate multiple people at once by using this technique. And then you have scarcity, it is possible to use scarcity scarcity to create a feeling of urgency in a decision-making context. Specific language can be used to heighten urgency and manipulate victims. Salespeople often use scarcity to manipulate clients by telling a customer that an offer is for only today and that there are limited supplies. And social engineers, they will use similar techniques. And then you have familiarity. So individuals, they can be influenced by things or people that they like or they are familiar with. Social engineers can take advantage of these human vulnerabilities to manipulate their victims. They have trust. Attackers will take advantage of the trust a person has in another person or organization in order to influence them to perform some action or reveal sensitive information. And then you have urgency. So it is possible to manipulate a person with a sense of immediate urgency to prompt him or her to act quickly. Using urgency, social engineers force their victims to act very fast to avoid or rectify a perceived danger dangerous or painful situation. All right, so that was my quick little class on social engineering techniques. So let's go ahead and do some of this wonderful check on learning. So the first question is, an email message containing a warning related to a non-existent computer security threat asking a user to delete system files falsely identified as malware and or prompting them to share the message with others, this would be an example of what? Would this be vishing, impersonation, a hoax, or phishing? So the email message contains a warning related to a non-existent computer security threat asking a user to delete system files falsely identified as malware and or prompting them to share the message with others. What would this be an example of? And the correct answer is this will be a hoax, in particular, a virus hoax. And the things that you got to realize in this question, they were talking about this is a non-existent computer security threat where they're asking them to delete files. But most importantly, they are asking them to share the message with other people. So out of all the answers here possible, the only one that could possibly fit this scenario would be a hoax because hoax, you are normally encouraged to share those messages with others for whatever reason the person wants you to share them for. Next question, which social engineering attack relies on identity theft? Would this be impersonation, dumpster diving, watering hole attack, or shoulder surfing? So which one of these relies on identity theft? And the correct answer is, this would be impersonation. Now, dumpster diving, that could potentially play into identity theft to a certain extent. Also, shoulder surfing could tie into it. But you got to remember, guys, when you are taking these tests, they may give you a question that has multiple answers, but you have to select the best answer. And in this case, impersonation is the best answer to answer this question. Next question. Which term refers to the practice of registering misspelled domain names that closely resemble other well-established and popular domain names in hopes of getting internet traffic from users? Would this be hybrid warfare, pretexting, credential harvesting, or typo squatting? So which is the practice of registering misspelled domain names that look like somebody else's website so that they can get traffic to that site? And the correct answer is... This would be typo squatting, typo squatting. So you see my website name down at the bottom left, technologyg.com. An example of typo squatting would be somebody type in technologyg.com. -E 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 
Group.com. So the G would have three E's on it instead of two. That would be an example of typo squatting. So in summary, we have talked about pre-pending, identity fraud, invoice scams, credential harvesting, reconnaissance, hoax, impersonation, watering hole attack, typo squatting, pretexting, influence campaigns, and principles related to reasons for effectiveness. Now, if you felt like you've gotten something valuable out of this information, go ahead and hit the like button, share button, drop a comment, but most importantly, subscribe to this channel. Also, go check out my website, Technology G, so that you can get read up on the latest and greatest to help you successfully pass the CompTIA Security Plus SY0-601 certification. And until next video, ladies and gentlemen, peace.